It really comes down to digging into the problem and the why behind it. I don't know if you've heard of the five whys, but if someone would say like, oh yeah, I don't like remote work, then you'd ask like why, and you keep digging a level deeper and a level deeper until you really find the root of the problem. Welcome to How I Fixed It, a podcast where we cut the noise and learn step-by-step strategies entrepreneurs use to grow. I'm your host, Madhav Malhotra, and today I'm lucky to be joined by Javier Sanchez Mejorado, the co-founder of Afino. Afino is a startup that creates HR software to help employees with remote work. I'm especially excited to hear more about Javier's examples of how to reflect on his customers' needs, as well as how to reflect on his own. I just wanted to thank you again for taking the time to join me because I am very excited to hear about all of your journey in terms of pivoting, in terms of making the most of the pandemic to grow your business. And I really appreciate you sharing your raw stories because I think that's the most important part. So I'd love to start with that story. In terms of yourself, could we hear a little bit about who you are and how you got started working on Afino? Yeah, so first of all, thank you for having me. I'm really excited to kind of share my journey with you and all the different experiences that I've had. Um, To tell you a little bit more about myself, I graduated from Queen's University with a Bachelor of Computer Engineering. I was actually lucky enough to enter an incubator and accelerator program out of the Queen's University called QUICSI, which stands for Queen's University Summer Initiative. And from there, I was able to launch uh, the company that I'm currently working on called Afino. And to give you a little more background on kind of what Afino is or does, um, Afino is essentially a Slack app for fast growing, innovative and distributed teams that leverages AI to create more meaningful connections across an organization. Unlike a lot of our competitors, Afino learns about your team to find more personal and professional synergies that create a more collaborative working environment. So since the summer of 2020, I've been working with three of my co-founders to kind of get that up and going. And and so far, there's been a lot of a lot of learning along along the way that I'm, I'm really excited to get into throughout this podcast. Yeah, thank you for that introduction. I know the year in 2020 it was a rough time and especially to start a business there i'm sure you must have had your fair amount of challenges over the summer so could you tell us a little bit about when you entered quixie well what did you start off with and were there any big pivots once the pandemic hit yeah yeah so even before the pandemic happened, I actually started a company called Burst. And essentially what we were trying to do was centralize campus-wide events throughout Queen's University. And once the pandemic hit, that's when we kind of realized that in-person events weren't really going to continue into the future. So we pivoted into uh, what is known right now as the Fino. And what we really saw um, as a big problem throughout the pandemic was that remote workers were completely isolated and they felt quite lonely while working at home, even though productivity levels are up and a lot of businesses are very happy with their output, the employees themselves felt almost disenfranchised from their company. So after we spoke to hundreds and hundreds of different companies across Canada and the United States, and we realized that remote work is is here to stay and there's definitely a problem uh, to be solved there and into the future there's that this is definitely a market that uh, we can grow into yeah could you tell me about that well like hundreds of companies how did you find out yeah so a lot of our outreach was cold outreach so we would message people on linkedin or through email and At the beginning, we were playing a lot of the university uh, card. So what I mean by that is we would kind of tell people a little bit about our story and where we come from. And people love to help young, driven individuals who are kind of looking to make a difference. So that was a huge uh, value point of ours. But also a lot of the the connections that we found was through our network. The value of, of your network was definitely 
proven at that point in time, just even through Quixi, they're able to connect us with so many different individuals. Our current advisor, Zach Hemraj, who is the CEO of Lupio, we actually met through um, Quixi. So that was definitely a huge value add to us uh, throughout the summer. And how did you keep track of all of this insight so that you could tell? Yeah, across the board, we have this issue of workers being unhappy. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. So a lot of the research that we were doing from the beginning was related to um, HR people in general, because we realized that a lot of people um, were having a hard time essentially being connected to their work. Like the, re- the way we found that out was just based on conversations. We would reach out to people and let them talk to us about their problems, what they're liking about remote work, what they're not liking about it. And people love the flexibility. And I think that's a big reason why remote work is definitely the future. But at the same time, a lot of people felt almost isolated in their home. Like they didn't feel a disconnection between their work and their personal lives. And they realized that in order for, for this to continue, we need to find a solution to kind of have more synergies between uh, coworkers. So they feel like they're connected to something bigger than just their individual work. Hmm. Now, if I could dig in here for a second. Um, yeah. If you're having these interviews, what kinds of questions would you be asking? The Are you speaking to employees here or their HR bosses? Yeah, it's a really good question. So at the beginning, we were strictly speaking to employees and managers of teams because even though this is a problem for HR people, it really comes down from the from the bottom up, right? So the employees are the ones facing the biggest issues and then they go and they talk to their HR team and their HR team does something about it. Um, so a lot of these, inter- these interviews and the questions were related to what the biggest problem is within their current company and whether or not they like remote work and why they did or, or they did not. Like it really comes down to kind of digging into the problem and, and the why behind it. I don't know if you've heard of the, the concept of the five whys, but essentially um, if someone would say like, oh yeah, I don't like remote work, then you'd kind of ask like why and you kind of keep digging a level deeper and a level deeper until you, you really find the root of the problem. And what we found was that um, even though people are really liking the flexibility, like a lot of employees were not feeling and are currently not feeling connected to each other or the company, which is why, as we've seen right now, there's a pretty high turnover for a lot of companies. And that that has to do with the fact that like people want to work somewhere that they feel like they're making a difference. They feel like they're part of something larger than themselves and kind of adding value to the world and to their company. Yeah, uh, I definitely have heard of the Five Wise framework. And for research, it often guides me in a very nice way. Though when, I, when I've tried digging down into wise with people in conversations, I, I find that people can get a little bit hesitant if I keep going like, why, 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 tell me. Mm-hmm. And uh, also like if sometimes they might think, hey, it's just obvious, like they just restate what was already said. Are there yeah. any specific phrases or types of ways that you ask these questions to kind of lighten yeah. up the tone and keep the conversation going? Yeah, no, that's, that's a great question. Um, so something that I've learned throughout this entire experience is when, pe- when you ask people why, they get very defensive. It's almost like they feel like you don't understand where they're coming from. So I like to frame my questions um, around more like what or how, so kind of understanding and having some empathy around their answer and being able to dig deeper that way. So for example, if you told me like, oh, I don't like remote work, instead of me saying like, why don't you like remote work? I would say like, oh, what parts of remote work don't you like? Or is there anything in remote work that you think is missing? Or how could we make remote work better for you? Like the, those kind of things and kind of dig deeper that way instead of just uh, bluntly asking why to show a little bit of empathy to them. And, and it also makes the conversation go a lot better. 
um, I find that I've learned the most out of conversations that are more fluid and natural instead of me just digging deeper with like a scripted question, just because people open up a little bit more that way. And you're also able to really see kind of the problem behind it, not just like what they think the problem is, if that, if that kind of makes sense. Yeah, that sounds like an idea to the book, Never Split the Difference. Is that correct? Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Though, could you, could you expand upon that? Like, what's the difference between what they think is the problem versus what the actual problem is? Yeah, so... I'm sure you've heard of the the famous quote by um, Ford, which essentially says, if I asked people what they wanted, they would have set up a faster horse, right? So as the head of product at Afino, my job is to kind of find the exact pain points that a lot of people are having. So it's more than just listening to them and, and hearing them and then writing that down verbatim. You kind of have to have some empathy behind your thoughts and, and think, critically as to why exactly these people are saying what they're saying. A real life example is one of our previous customers was talking to us about how they really want Afino to be able to provide more efficient networking opportunities for their employees. And what we found was that the reason they wanted something that everyone would be interested in attending was because Right now, the way that they were doing it was making these scheduled one-off events that a lot of people found awkward. A lot of people really didn't like attending, which is why attendance fell off significantly throughout the course of the pandemic. A lot of people tried to do happy hour on the Friday, and then it didn't really work for people just because even though they were connecting beyond work it felt very forced and it felt not organic at all which is kind of the whole point of those conversations in the first place so essentially what we realized was it's not enough to just put people in a room and say oh yeah like have some some good conversations like talk about yourself because especially over zoom or over another video conferencing it's very difficult to kind of really read a person and really have an in-depth conversation, especially when you're the only one talking and then everyone else is listening, people are kind of talking over each other. So we found that it's better to build those connections one-on-one or to share something about yourself with the team in a more organic uh, fashion. So if I understand what you're saying, the customer you were working Mm -hmm. with, they just wanted another iteration of a networking event so that you know something new could be tried but what you were trying to do was to dig down in terms of why didn't existing versions of the networking events work and once you found that then you could create like a more meaningful solution with the one-on-one meetings or organic meetings yeah exactly yeah exactly it's a little bit counterintuitive if i were to do it the first time i might just be like hey buy talk to the customer they're willing to pay me money uh, why don't i just go build mm-hmm. the first thing i see was that like a lesson you had to learn the hard way or did quixi provide guidance so that you could avoid that yeah no we definitely learned that lesson the hard way so to kind of dig into my story a little bit more um so out of quixi We were all fully committed into the product that we were launching and we were able to successfully launch in September and kind of continued to develop throughout October, November and December. And we quickly realized that we didn't essentially listen to our customer in in the right way. And what I mean by that is we actually did go ahead and uh, build a lot of these one-off events. And we found that even though the HR person or the particular customer was asking for this, it wasn't exactly the solution that they needed. And we, we did have to learn that the hard way because we essentially realized that there's no way that we would be able to build a subscription software platform around these one-off events just because of scalability. And then also the traction that we were having wasn't uh, where we needed to be. 
So a big lesson learned there was the concept of an MVP is, in my opinion, now that I've gone through all this, isn't necessarily a minimum viable product, but more a minimum viable prototype or a minimum viable proof. Essentially, you need to be able to prove to yourself that the solution that you're working on would add value to your customers before you build anything larger. The idea behind the product is a, a more polished, clean solution. And that's what we did build in those first few months. And we have now since pivoted into more of a Slack-based application um, because we realized that in order to have a successful product, you first kind of need to take the first step and make a prototype that adds value to people. If you can add value to people through something super basic, not polished, then then you can really hit the ground running and, and kind of move forward into a more a clean solution. So what should you have done to just test the minimum viable proof if you could go back? Yeah, so... In order for us to test um, the one-off events from the beginning, what we should have done was just manually conduct an event or two with companies and see what the traction is like and see what that feedback is like. That's what we should have done. But what we ended up doing was coming up with at least 20 or more events, putting them all on like a marketplace and then telling people, hey, look at all of our events, come and, come and check them out. And that was definitely a, a big learning point for us when we realized that Essentially, all this building, all these things we did was not providing the value that it needed to provide for our customer to come back on a weekly or even monthly basis. So that's exactly why we're now um, in Slack and we're taking it much more minimum viable proof kind of concept where we would just we're just kind of experimenting with features. And then once a feature has some traction, we dig a little bit deeper and we kind of are able to really start polishing and, and seeing where that value really comes from. Cause that's, that's kind of where um, we're able to grow. Right. Yeah, for sure. I keep hearing that word traction. How do you mm -hmm. measure traction? What metrics are you looking at? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. Um, so it depends the type of platform that you have, but for, B2B platform, the way that we're uh, measuring our traction is with the weekly active users. Being an HR product, we realize that a lot of the things that we do sometimes get pushed off to the side uh, because they're not as mission critical to a lot of departments. So in order for us to be successful, we need to have a pretty high weekly active user percentage. And we're even looking, you probably even need to have more than 100%. So what I mean by more than 100% weekly active users is it's spreading throughout the organization. So if you start in, for example, your sales department, people are talking about your product, people are spreading it throughout the organization and it spreads to maybe your engineering department or your marketing, and you're able to kind of grow throughout an organization, that's when you really know that you have traction and you have product market fit. Like it theoretically sounds like a really nice outcome. But yeah, I guess in real life, in, it's just... in reality, yeah. So, yeah. So I can what I can kind of talk about in real life. I would say is that it's better to start with like a smaller subset of uh, people. So, uh, one of the companies that we're working with right now is strictly piloting our product with their marketing team, and. The reason that they're doing that is because they need to be able to see the value that it would provide before rolling it out to their entire organization. And I mean, that makes a lot of sense from their perspective because whenever anyone bets on a startup but on a young company, they are, they're taking a risk on the team that they're betting on as well as the solution, right? So if we're able to provide value to a smaller subset of people, then we can kind of expand into the greater organization. Yeah. Another thing I'm curious about is like, at the end of the day, it's just four guys and a bunch yeah. of graphs on screen. How do you connect yeah. the dots to realize like, okay, this trend that we're seeing in greater weekly active users, that's actually caused by mm -hmm. people at that organization 
spreading the word? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. So luckily for us, the way that a lot of companies distribute their Slack channels is uh, based on the different sectors within that company. So we're able to see when our Slack app is added to another sector. So for example, right now we're in the marketing channel, but once it spreads, it would be added to the sales channel or the engineering. And that's kind of when you're able to see that there's some, I call it sneezeability. It's based off of the book Purple Cow, which essentially talks about people need to sneeze, need to spread the idea of, of the value that you're trying to provide within a company in order to have um, internal virality. It needs to be like sneezable in, in a way in order to be able to grow within a company. Yeah, that's amazing to hear. Uh, it sounds like you really read a lot. Are there any other recommendations you'd have? So a, a big part of the reason why I even wanted to make a startup or even start a business in, in the first place is based off of the book, The Lean Startup. Um, when I immigrated to Canada from Mexico, I kind of grew up with my parents being self-starters, starting their own business and was really into technology and I've always been a bit of a techie. So I started researching different books and different ideologies to, to follow. And I came across The Lean Startup, which Honestly, looking back now, it kind of changed my life. Just the concept and the journey that Eric Ries points out was really intriguing to me and uh, led me to, honestly, the career path that I'm on right now. And so right now, I'm reading an interesting book for anyone in the product side of things. It's called Inspired, How to Create Tech Products Customers Love. Definitely a great read. Really recommend it. Just really breaks down the role of a product manager and exactly what it means to build a product that people really find value in. It comes down to essentially the experience that you're providing people and how you're able to really make essentially the brand around your product a, a positive a positive one. I'll be sure to link to all these books that you're mentioning. Um, I met a question on top of that. Not everyone I know has like a great reading habit. Is there anything that helps you in terms of making time to consistently read or? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Honestly, I was one of those people when I was younger and what really helped me was audiobooks. actually. Um, I found that instead of listening to music, I would pop in, go on Audible or there's a lot of other sources to get your audiobooks. And just kind of walk around, listen to audiobooks instead of music. In the car, I would play audiobooks. And that's what really got me going into reading more because I find that when you're able to absorb the content in, in a way that is more digestible for yourself, you kind of get more into uh, the content itself. Um, so I would recommend start with, starting with podcasts and then... Once, if you get into some of that, then audiobooks would be your next transition. And then from there, I feel like you'll definitely get into some more books that we don't have uh, an audio version. So it sounds like you're saying people should experiment with different mediums to see. Which... Yes, exactly. Okay. That's interesting. Um, and regarding the issue of you don't uh, maybe feel motivated to finish off a book. Do you just leap off a book? Do you try new things a lot? Yeah, so personally, I found that the best way to finish a book is to have a routine. So every morning, I try to read at least two chapters, maybe three of whatever particular book I'm reading. Um, having a routine has really helped me to essentially prioritize the things that I want to accomplish that day. And a big part of that is obviously reading just because there's, I've, I've learned so many different things just off of the books I've read. And I've been able to kind of grab some of those methodologies and those ideas and apply them to my day-to-day -day life, which has been really exciting for me. Yeah. I think people might take notes on books. I'm not sure, but the way I've always done it is like come back to the notes when I realize, hey, there's a situation at hand where I could need this. Yeah. 
Is that the way that you approach applying this knowledge? Do you maybe set up, you know, practices or challenges or some other method to apply the knowledge? Um, so I tend to have a little bit of a short attention span. So what I do or what's been working really well for me in terms of absorbing this information and kind of applying it in the future is I have this little, it's almost like a little diary of all the things that I learned that day. So every day I would go in, into it at the end of the day and kind of reflect on uh, what I accomplished and, and what I learned. And I found that extremely valuable, especially with the books that I'm reading, because that's where most of my knowledge comes from throughout the day. So just kind of reflect back and, and kind of realize, okay, I read this particular methodology in this book today. Like, how could I apply that into what I'm doing with Afino right now? A lot of the books that I read have to do with either startups or products or stuff that I'm currently very involved in. And that has really helped me to kind of stay involved in the book and stay kind of in tune with what I'm reading, just because it's a lot of it is so applicable to what I'm doing on a day to day basis. But in the future, I would kind of or for for anyone listening, I would recommend kind of reflecting back on your day and being able to take out like the key pieces of either learning or things that kind of got you excited that kind of sparked some creativity because I find that people are so busy like I'm so busy throughout every day and there's a million things being thrown at me so at the end of the day to kind of calm myself down and reflect back to what I essentially accomplished um, that day has been really beneficial for me to actually absorb and take in exact uh, what I what I read and what what else what other things I learned as well throughout that day. Yeah, that's amazing to hear about. I think you've also told me about how every morning you're on Product Hunt. So like, <laughs> I, it seems like you're really someone who has created a lot of routines in your life that are helpful to you. If we can wrap up, I'd love to hear about that. What's your process like in terms of all the routines you have in a day? What are you doing? <laughs> Yeah, no, I definitely love routines. I think it's because I'm a very analytical brain. So routine really puts me at ease. But my routine right now, so I'm actually working in Vancouver, but I'm working on the Eastern uh, time zone, right? So I'm waking up around 5am to kind of catch up with the rest of my co-founders who are in Ontario and the East Coast. And I really like to start my day off by just reading. So I wake up, have my morning coffee because I, I need that to kind of get going. And then from there, I tend to read about two or three chapters. And a lot of the time that sparks a little bit of creativity as to like what I, I'm currently working on. I tend to make a few notes on exactly what I, I want to accomplish that day. So I really find it useful to make almost like a to-do list for the day. So after I read, I go into some of that, lo looking through our sprint, looking at what the future of the product will kind of look like. And then from there, I'm always so curious to see what's on Product Hunt, just because there's always so many interesting kind of concepts and ideas that people are working on. It's also kind of inspiring to kind of go on there and see all these different people from around the world working on some really, really cool products. So I tend to spend maybe 10, 15 minutes on there just to kind of browse. And then from there, that's when I really start like my, my work day. So we have team standups every morning around eight or nine. And then from there, it's all, it's pretty much head down working until I would say around two. And then I find that at that point in the day, I'm a little bit drained. So in order to kind of get re-energized, I like to go outside, do something outdoors, whether that's either go on a hike or some sort of exercise or even catching up with a friend it really tends to re-energize me for the later part of the day where I kind of try to get everything else that I made on that to-do list done and, and finish up with a little bit of reflecting depending on uh, what I accomplished that day and, and so on. Yeah. Would it be fair to assume that you developed that process like in bits and pieces over time? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no. A lot of that actually, um, I think, comes from my father because he tends to also, he has a very similar routine with the to-do list. So growing up, I always have, I always saw him holding, oh, he had like a little, uh, almost like a card with 
um, a bunch of different things that he wanted to accomplish that day. And then as he would do them, I would see him like cross it out. So I think a lot of that actually came from him. But then also I've thrown in a few things that I'm interested in or that I found have helped me uh, be productive throughout the day. Yeah, it sounds like you've been at it for quite a while. And it definitely is paying off now as um, you figure out what works for you. So I think I really value this example of how you can develop that kind of self-awareness over time to know like exactly at 2 p.m. That's usually when I get tired and develop all these other insights about yourself. So I really do appreciate you sharing all of this knowledge, all of the resources that you, that you recommended about how to best prepare not only for the startup world, but also just for how to optimize your own life and live that to the best of your potential. Yeah, no, I, I really enjoyed um, sharing it with you. 